Welcome to the We Get Outdoors podcast. My name is Rob Yates, I am your host, and welcome to this episode. In this episode, we get to know kayaking movie star, world-renowned kayak and canoe coach, and expedition professional paddler, Paul Cuthy. In this interview with Paul, we get to find out about his transformational approach to kayak coaching, the greatest piece of advice he was given to become a professional kayaker, how he learned to drive age 13, and how a tidal error almost resulted in death at one of the world's largest tidal rapids, Butsy. This is the We Get Outdoors podcast, and let's jump straight into this epic episode. This episode is brought to you by the We Get Outdoors tribe, where your next adventure is just one click away. You can join this, the fastest growing outdoor group on planet Earth, and become part of a tribe of like-minded outdoor enthusiasts, sharing your adventures, their adventures, trips and insights, and helping to ensure you plan and have the most perfect adventures. Click on the link in the description below to join for free right now. So, Mr. Paul Cuthy, Mr. Paul Cuthy, welcome to the We Get Outdoors podcast. Welcome to this special experience. And um, tell me, tell me, what are you most excited about doing in the outdoors next? Well, I, it's, I am looking forward to uh, some of my adventures with the kids. I want to start off by saying thanks for having me. It's exciting. I love to uh, be a part of these sort of things and being able to chat around my favorite subjects uh, is going to be probably the best part of the day. Uh, so thanks for, thanks for giving me the opportunity. Um, so the, uh, the next thing I'm excited about doing in the outdoors, well, so this could be grand adventures or small things. For me, I'm really looking forward to getting out and having a, a rip around the bike track with the kids. We go to a BMX track here locally and then um, little Canyon, Canyon, my oldest son, who is about to turn five on Halloween. We're having his birthday party this weekend. He is, he's been uh, practicing his wet exits uh, out of his kayak in the living room. And he's also been practicing his swimming in the pool. And we're going to try to combine those things here coming up. So my next big outdoor adventure is going to be in an indoor swimming pool in Portland, where, uh, where the little guy will be uh, hopefully just playing and flashing around and having a great time in his kayak there. Uh, but it is creaking season also, so it's starting to rain around here. So I'm looking forward to getting back on to a lot of the local creeks here in the Pacific Northwest. It's it's pretty epic. Uh, there's uh, Class 5 whitewater every direction uh, from Portland, and so that stuff's all coming online here as the rain began. So looking forward to that as well. Cool. Um, so when we first met, I want to re rewind your head all the way back to those years ago when you and I first met. It was it was at an event, uh, a kayaking event on an island in the Columbia River, I think. Is that right? It's true. And you sure you want to go there because I have some good stories from you back there. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to tread a funny line on that. But I, 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 this, thing, <laughs> this thing struck me because I met this really nice guy called Paul who I knew nothing about. I'd flown from the UK to go coach at this event. I met this nice guy called Paul and we drank quite a lot of beer. And other people at the event like held you to a level of esteem greater than me because I didn't know who Paul Koofy was. I was just like, he's a cool guy to drink beer with. And um, they held you to this level. And somebody, people kept saying to me, oh, wow, well, have you kayaked with Paul Koofy much? Paul's this, that, and that, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, who are we talking about here? Who are we talking about? And the clients on my course were like, you must have known Paul for ages. Maybe you're a kayaking god like Paul. How did you get this reputation amongst those people? Smoke and mirrors. Smoke and mirrors. No, I. I <laughs> so, part of part of what I think has been important about what I've always done with folks on the water, and these are a lot of times are going to be students that have coached, is is that I've not just taught them a sport or taught them a physical skill. I've I've joined them on their own transformational journey. So I've had a part in them achieving something that actually transforms how they think of themselves. And when you connect with somebody on that level and they can associate you with that happening they, they they never forget you and they will sing your praises for for the ages uh and and not being 
drawn to this heroic persona so much to where it's all about you, but actually when you're joining them on the water, making it all about them and, and having them be the big winner of the day. And so that's, that is, is probably the most important piece of it. Um, cause honestly, there is uh, far better paddlers than I that have far larger balls. And I have, uh, more, I, th- I think my, my strength is connecting with people and, and having them discover their own journey that they're, they're super stoked on. Mm. Where, where does that come from or originate from in your like outdoor youth as it were because the ability to go and not just tell people what to do to be better but to uh, inspire them and ask them the right questions to go on that transformational journey with them isn't one that is just like doesn't happen off the back of some like learn to be a kayak instructor course where does that come from in your youth you know it's hard to say i uh the introduction for me into the sport was it was in a way that I think inspired it right right from the start. So we, my dad and I, who were canoe partners in the uh, flatlands of Missouri, uh, is where I'm from, is, is St. Louis, we have a, amazing floating streams, some of the best spring-fed floating streams in, in, anywhere in the world. So you can take a canoe and go out with the family for ages, and there's gravel bars and beautiful bluffs and uh, crystal clear blue springs, and it's just an ideal place to fall in love with the river as a kid. Uh, but when we took our first kayaking course, our first whitewater class was at a local community college. I was uh, 10 years old, and so I was uh, stuck into a class with a bunch of adults and this amazing coach uh, named Greg Brown. Greg uh, taught this class, and uh, he was an architect by day, but was a hilarious river hippie by night, and would uh, would would bring his antics into this kayak class, and, and I connected with him right away. And he would invite coaches or rather students of that class to come back and coach and, and volunteer and help out with the next round of students. And uh, so from right, right from the beginning, it created this cohesive community, this thing where nobody got paid. I mean, you, if you brought your own whitewater kayak, which was rare in St. Louis, Missouri in the day, this was back in uh, 1993, um, that, that, that you, you would basically get paid 20 bucks if you let a student you know, use your boat for a six-week course. Uh, which I was really excited about at 10. I was like, woo, making 20 bucks. Uh, but you got invited to teach one-on-one. They would do a classroom portion upstairs. And then all the uh, former students, now instructors, would be down in the pool practicing their skills, getting some free pool time. And then when the students came down, you gave up your boat and you volunteered for an hour or two to teach. And then everybody went to the pub afterwards. And so it was always about that community. It was always about lifting each other up and teaching somebody exactly what you knew to help reinforce that learning and also just to keep you inspired and keep you challenged and engaged with the, the sport on a different level, different different level of understanding when you have to teach it. So um, I just got charged up uh, and that was my way to connect and, and have, have uh, be challenged and, and grow confidence to tell a bunch of adults what to do uh, as, as a kid and, and being able to see them have success and, and uh, get their role uh, or learn how to, you know, get over that fear of swimming out of their boat that and to be in that position that that was really exciting for me early on and it's just something i've stuck with coaching has been sort of a lifelong pursuit for me mm. I, I don't want to dwell on this next bit too too long but i'm I, I do know having known you for a long time i do know that your dad passed away while you were kayaking together um and that that was a horrific time in your life obviously um, but what I'm really intrigued about is most people would quit kayaking if they had something like that happen to them. Um, and yet Paul Koofy carried on kayaking and turned it into a job, turned it into being, a, I'd say, a poster child of kayaking and canoeing in North America, um, sponsored coach, charge of programs. What, what draw, drew you to keep going after your dad passed away? It's a, it's a good question, and I, you know, it's one I, I remember contemplating. I, I just think we remember considering uh, that option of just giving up the sport. You know, it was something that my dad, my uncle, uh, did together, and uh, we joined that community of people in Missouri, and uh, they they really became a river family. Uh, and and I did I did consider stepping away from the sport and just giving it some time. One of the things that was an important distinction for me through making that decision was that it wasn't actually the sport that, that took him. He died of a heart attack on the side of the river. Uh, but he was actually the only one that didn't swim that rapid. He 
did, he did pretty well. He was uh, he was a good kayaker, but uh, he um, he suffered that heart attack due to uh, life choices, uh, lifelong life choices, and and it was something that uh, that could also be uh, have some genetic disposition too. But uh, essentially, I I made that that distinction in my mind that this wasn't the sport that killed him. In fact, it, it maybe even kept him long a lot lives longer. Um, physically but what i did what i did notice is that it was uh, the sport that, that kept him actually feeling alive even through some dark times and even through uh what must have been ongoing uh symptoms of of having this this heart condition so uh it it was something that i recognized as being really important uh as uh, as a, like a life force for me and, and us my connection to him keeping that memory alive i associated with that you know, making that distinction that, that he didn't actually die from the sport. Uh, um, those are all into it. But really, ultimately, what, what made it possible was both my uncle's uh, influence, uh, my dad's brother, and I uh, only only grew closer in that time. And uh, Uncle John and I went on many, many river adventures together. So having someone step into that role in that way really helped, but also the community. So that, that river family that I formed, you, you form really tight bonds in the outdoors when you are... Uh, you know, surviving down a set of river rapids and you're isolated, you're taking care of each other, you're really operating in a critical environment where you, you know, you can, there's no cell phones back then, but even if you had a cell phone and you could call 911, it, a lot of times they're not going to see you for hours if they can even find where you are and reach you in some of those places. That's what's special about the sport. Uh, and that's what, you know, would have made the, the, the chances of my dad's survival there on the side of the river nearly impossible anyway. But it's really, uh, it's really that community that those folks that supported me and helped essentially raise me uh, out there on the river. Uh, those, those folks are, are in relationships are not something that I was willing to give up, and uh, and also what made it possible for me to, to continue on. So, uh, building that strong community back there and having uh, my uncle and making that distinction all all factored in. Mm. Now, I'd like you to share with me a story uh, with our listeners as well. I believe your Uncle John taught you how to drive at one point in time. Well, that was a, that was a combined effort. So when you're going on your, your paddle on the river a lot, you have to run shuttle, and there's a lot of opportunities to drive cars in the middle of nowhere. But uh, there's a, a distinct trip that we would take uh, a family friend uh, named Steve Landrum, who's, who's also passed at this point, Steve was one of my dad's best buddies. He was a little drinking buddy, quite honestly. But Steve uh, would always take us to the Indianapolis 500, which is uh, you know a huge spectacle in sport, and hundreds of thousands of people were there. And you kind of kind of get into the driving whole car thing. And so when I was when I was starting at about 13, I believe they would let me drive around uh, the back roads a little bit at that event. And, and and running shuttle on the river, there's a lot of dirt roads and a lot of places where there's, you're not going to see anybody else anyway. So I would get to run shuttle quite often. And, and they always uh, they would always give me a bunch of shit because I, kayaking from the age of 10 till 16, got out of doing a lot of the shuttles. I could just sit there and enjoy my time on the side of the river and you know watch the gear while everybody else ran around and did the work. Uh, but uh, there was a distinct memory I have at a 14 coming home from the Indianapolis 500 where we actually drove all the way from St. Louis to Pennsylvania to have the Yakagani River. We did a, turn that into a weekend a weekend river trip and on the way back from our weekend Yakagani River trip in Pennsylvania caught the Indianapolis 500 in Indianapolis on the way home. So to give that some perspective, that's like a 14 plus hour drive to Pennsylvania and then another 11 hour drive to Indianapolis and then you're six or six or so hours from home so uh we caught the indy 500 and after the race uh starting in Terre Haute, indiana which is on the border of indiana and illinois my uh, uncle john tossed me the keys at age 14 and said get us home and so for the next <laughs> several hours i with the, the wheel <laughs> gripply the wheel uh tightly in my grip and my my eyes sort of i, I, I lined up the, the, the stripe on the side of the road with a certain spot on the hood and if I kept that in about the right space, I knew that I wasn't going to kind of drive off the road or, or, or weave around too much. And for, for it must have been, I think, three and a half hours or so, just stared at the hood and the line and the relationship between those two things. And I managed to get us home. I managed to get us home. But that was in our uh, huge suburban 5,500 pounds of just Chevy iron 
uh, hurtling down the road with shoddy brakes and loose steering and uh, yeah, sheer adrenaline behind the wheel. So it was it was fun. It was good good learning. You know, good learning sticks when you're in a heightened emotional state, Rob. So uh, I, I learned to drive with that with that on my. <laughs> and Uncle John was he just sleeping in the passenger seat, or what was he up to? I I don't think he was trusting enough in my ability to sleep, uh, and he didn't have to grab the wheel at any point. There was some there was some dodgy moments as we were merging onto the highway for the first time. But uh, no, he played he played it cool. We did not tell my mom about that when we got home. And, uh, <laughs> it was. It was pretty freaking cool. Uh, 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 yeah, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> and so then, carry, carrying on, you uh, you then moved from Missouri to the Pacific Northwest, um, which is a flipping big move, all on your own. What what was the instigation behind that? The, the big move, the big move. Well, so. I had I had decided I was going to be a professional kayaker uh, early on in my teen years, and uh, I did take a huge trip out to Alaska for the summer. And when you drive from St. Louis to Alaska, it's about thirty hours. And making our way home, we decided to come down the whole West Coast of San Francisco, so you know, just check the place out. And uh, after that summer, I decided that moving west was the right move for me, um, and. I wasn't really sure about that decision leading up to that. And it's, it's because I was kind of stuck in the middle of St. Louis and I had a girlfriend and a wife and parents and family and a job and all these things that, that, that had me there uh, in a place where, you know, you had to drive 14 hours to go find white water. And we were, I was working for uh, the shop back there called the Alpine shop. Excellent, excellent specialty outdoor retailer store in the St. Louis area. It's, it's the only place for, kind of technical gear and I was working for the Alpine shop the minute I turned 16 I went and applied for a job there and one of the things I, I got to do that was so cool at, at, at that time was uh, there was a big film tour there was the outside magazine uh, film tour about the Sangco River expedition led by Scott Lindgren and uh, Scott Lindgren is a, a, a astounding expedition paddler and somebody I hope to hear on this podcast because uh, he's got he's got a hell of a story but he was in St. Louis with the Outside Magazine Film Tour, and I was tasked to, as the ambassador to the Alpine Shop and the, and the host retailer there, I was tasked with getting Scott from uh, the the theater to the after party and dinner and, and all these things. And they uh, they figured, you know, send send the Whitewater kid to go drive around with the Expedition Whitewater paddler. Um, super cool opportunity. I, I should still should thank my manager for that one, uh, Mike Hammer. Back in the day, I think he too set me up with that that thing. But in that car ride, while we were driving around, uh, getting lost in the, the wrong neighborhoods in downtown St. Louis late at night, um, I, I I got to see Scott Lindgren a little bit nervous. Like he had been facing like uh, <laughs> he'd like stared down the barrel of a gun literally on his expedition and uh, was being extorted and, and by uh, folks in in Nepal. But I got to see and, and running class you know, five, six whitewater on, in the middle of nowhere. But I got to see him uh, nervous a little bit because we were, we were definitely driving down the wrong streets at the wrong time of day in that city. And, uh, but during that, that drive, uh, he, he shared something with me that, that, that really shifted my perspective and made me choose and know that I had to leave town, which was that, uh, you know, I told him I wanted to be a professional tag and he said, that's, that's great. You know, what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to move somewhere you can paddle every day. And it's like, Obviously, right? And but I, and I had not truly faced that that fact in my own mind. Uh, but he he instantly knew what I was thinking and, and said it. Followed it up with, you know, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to break up with your girlfriend. You're gonna have to say goodbye to your family. You're gonna have to move away from everything that you know, and you're gonna have to make the choice if that's what you want to do. Then you're gonna need to put yourself in a place where that's possible. And uh, it was right there that I, I knew that. I was, I was, you know, secretly hoping I could take my girlfriend with me, but that didn't work out. But the, uh, the uh, that that fact that I was going to have to uproot my whole life and put myself in this position geographically to make it possible to even to even ha- take a stab at this elusive goal of mine, um, that that really hit home. And I still, I still, I've re- reached out to him and, and thanked him in person, and that I really feel like that was a 
turning point in my professional paddling career. Um, it would have never happened without that conversation. Awesome. So the, the whitewater canoeing guy rocks up in Portland. And um, what I, the, one of the questions I've always been curious about, and I've never asked you this, um, so I'm going to now, if uh, that's okay. Uh-oh. Um, you, you can't. I mean, you've asked me a lot of questions. So I have in the past. Just like, with, previously. Uh, yeah. I, I want to know about your first time properly sea kayaking. So you've been in canoes and you've been in nice, quick, spinny, turny, Eskimo uh whitewater kayaks, and you get to Portland, and then you get chucked into sea kayaks. What was those first experiences like? Yeah, so there's kind of two. It was a bit of a transition because I I was tasked with teaching the sea kayaking courses at the Alpine Shop in St. Louis, Missouri. Ah, okay. Uh, you you do the math there. There's the, the sea is very far away. I was going to uh, say that's, that, that, that's, that, that's, a, that's a that's a bigger than fourteen hour drive to get to the beach from there. <laughs> really, really far away. Um, and so we were taking uh, these essentially long recreational kind of sea kayaks, real sort of rudimentary things, and we were chucking people down the Mississippi River. There's a chain of rock rapids that go over a big. Uh, almost like a dam it basically backs up the water so the intakes for all the drinking water for people in st louis those, those stay submerged and it creates these huge rapids just six to eight foot uh waves at times if you get the right water level uh big glassy wave trains big holes for about about 200 yards and we would just flush people through there and most of them would swim and we would just hopefully pick them all up and put them back in their boats before we drifted past the takeout on the uh, other side of the river. Um, and so that was my only experience for, uh, of sea kayaking when I moved out here. And I didn't really know what it was all about. Uh, but so uh, at Alder Creek Kayak and Canoe in Portland, Oregon, is where I decided I needed to work, partially based on uh, Scott Lindgren's advice on where I should work. He named a few places. That was one of them. And the guys there, uh, Carl Anderson and Sandy Gilton and, and Steve Scheer, um, they were all about this, the sea kayak stuff. And I was like, sure, sure. You mean like those, like those like flat water boats that you can like, you can flush people through the big waves and they all flip over. Uh, and they're like, no, no, no. Like these, these really highly designed, highly efficient, super fun, like, proper fiberglass sea kayaks made in Britain, you know, like taking these out onto the Oregon coast where there's massive surf, big rocks, and caves, and all these things. And they were just all jazzed about it. So I was like, wow, that's, that sounds cool. And then they said something to me that I was like, oh, I must do it. They said, uh, well, you know, there's like, like, you know, class four, five, you know, white water rapids. Like there's class five sea kayaking too. And, uh, and, and they promised to go show me. And so I went out to Cascade Head, was one of the very first places that well, that's we one of my favorite places to go sea paddling cascade head on the oregon coast is is pretty incredible and it's it's a it's a fairly uh just beautiful place aesthetically but also the, the features there in the sea are amazing and i've been out you know i took my whitewater boat out in the waves and surfed around and surf before but I'd, I'd never actually traveled with a, a sea kayak properly on the sea or or gone offshore, or head, headed around a headland where there's no landing zones, or explored TK, any of that stuff. And this place has all of that. And and they uh, they they took us out and around the corner, and I'm sure it was similar to uh, the experiences I have taking whitewater paddlers out there now. It's just our jaws hit 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 the decks of our boats, and our eyes were uh, the size of the saucers, and you suddenly felt really far from shore. And the sea is very different from the river, and very dynamic, and changes all the time. Uh, but it was a small enough day where we could get in close and personal with the rocks and, and just explore those things. And that was where, that was where I learned the difference between the sea and the river and that you, uh, you need to watch the sea for a little bit before you commit to going through a particular spot in the rocks or going into a cave or a tunnel or a thing because all the waves are different sizes and different angles and different speeds and all these different dynamics happen. And so, uh, I, I found myself jumping into situations and places I, I probably shouldn't have, but it was just so amazing to be able to get to these places that no one else ever gets to see and, uh, and, and explore into the, into the cracks and crevices of the sea and, and getting close with it was, was just an amazing experience. So, 
Uh, and plus, the sea seems to be there even when there's no rain, even when there's no water in the rivers. <laughs> there's always water in the sea. Like, I can go kayaking any day I want, and it doesn't matter if, it, if it's rained or not. Like, yeah, sign me up. So, and no shuttle. Like, that's who, who, who doesn't. Who doesn't mind being able to like not have to drive cars around? You can just park at the spot, go boating all day, and then come back and be at the same spot. Uh, so can't can't beat that. <laughs> so the whole of going paddling really is about a series of adventures and misadventures. And um, in fact, anything in the outdoors really is about adventures and misadventures, and how well you come out the other side of misadventures. Um, I think it's really. Uh, important that people realize that even as outdoor experts, we still have our share of minor misadventures. Can you tell the guys the story about the Okisolo Island and the trip that you did up there? Okisolo, so uh, Okisolo is on the west coast up near Quadra Island, and that one was a uh, that one was a, an amazing trip. We filmed Pacific Horizons during that trip but I, I have a feeling you're hinting at the national geographic uh special we did over at the butsy tidal rapids a little further north on the west coast of canada uh, the was it tidal rapids, where we yeah that's where that, that's where we actually ended up camping out on the island there near the near the rapids i have a feeling that's that's the one you're you're, you're wanting yeah, to know yeah, more yeah. About. go on tell us more about that one <laughs> um <laughs> That that was a, uh, a trip that was put together. Um, Brian Smith of Real Water Productions um, started in his film and, and paddling career, um, making really, really highly produced, high definition, beautiful uh, sea kayaking films of really rough, rough water paddling and, and, and really dynamic storytelling. And it was it was something that was fairly new to the world of sea kayak. DVDs and, and things like that is when you was when you could actually put out a DVD and make make some cash and pay for your trips. Uh, there there was a, a series of filming that we did. Uh, Pacific Horizons was the first one, and then he made a follow up film called Eastern Horizons, and it got us really interested in uh, chasing these tidal rapids. Because a lot of sea kayakers, a lot of footage that we saw was going out on the open sea, doing long crossing, paddling at the same horizon line endlessly, or it was uh, some surf paddling you'd see some some, some long boats in like a, a traditional surf break sort of area which is cool but at some point you've seen when you've seen a, a boat surf a wave you've you it's a, i mean gosh the waves are all kind of the same same shape and and there's uh there's you can only ride for so long it's sort of a you get a you know 10 maybe 30 second ride if it's epic uh and then you have to start over again what we found uh these areas in the sea where the the sea would be really narrow and due to really large tides uh, all this water would get squeezed through a narrow spot and if it drops over just the right size seashell or the right conditions of this uh, you can you can see some massive waves that you can surf endlessly because they're stationary waves they're they're there and they change with the tide over over several hours but essentially you can surf for half an hour as opposed to 30 seconds and so these places both were intriguing because of the endless surf, but also the exploratory, mysterious nature of them because they would appear and disappear mm. based on the tides, based on the, on the height of the water. And not only did you have to figure out where they were and where these, these shelves, these sea shelves that the water would drop over and these constrictions and, and the right wind conditions, where these places would actually all coincide just right to make a magical wave, but then that wave was elusive. Uh, so both the place and the and the conditions need to be right, and so it it creates this very exploratory, mysterious uh, thing. And it's also when you start getting into some of these places, a lot of these big tides exist in places that are hard to get to, and off the beaten path and very remote. There's not a lot of people there, and so there's not a lot of people actually paddling them, and there's not a lot of people with good information. Uh, there's and there's not a lot of resources to know what's there or a lot of footage of them. Yet. So we're really we're trying to. Do seek these places out and, and expose them and, and get footage of them and, and show show the, the both the paddling world but also just the, the world around what exists there and how much power is in these these really dynamic tidal zones and so that's all of that stuff got National Geographic really interested and so Brian Smith was really wanting to produce this project we weren't sure where it was going to go or what it was going to be but uh, it would be something that would be really appealing for them 
Well, you know what also goes really well with National Geographic, like those stories, you have to have like a near-death experience, um, <laughs> which was not part of the plan. That is definitely not part of the plan, but uh, it is part of the adventure quite often. And so we were set up to go to this massive tidal rapid up there near Prince Rupert, where the few people that do paddle it are usually whitewater paddlers and they're, and they're locals. And in our research and exploring and trying to find these elusive places, we happened upon this this one. And I, I contacted some local paddlers, and they were saying, yep, it definitely there's definitely big waves there. I don't know if you want to take a sea kayak out there, uh, is what they said, but you, you can definitely find big waves there uh, and big whirlpools and big just big features, like not river-sized features, like ocean-sized features uh, but that, that behave like a river. And so we, uh, they said you camp out there, and and so we jumped on a series of ferries going from Portland all the way up. I think it was a 15-hour ferry ride. So what that means is that we had to drive after working off for work at the shop, and then driving driving up to catch the first ferry. And to be in line at the ferry, you basically sleep in the parking lot. Uh, and we were filming, and we needed to be on a certain ferry, so we drove up early and hung out in the parking lot till the next morning when the ferry was going to be there and caught our first non-night of sleep uh, underneath the tractor trailer in the parking lot of the, the, the ferry terminal there and then took a ferry over to the next spot where we had to catch the 15-hour ferry. And, and there was, I think, the next spot included some, some rocky sleep there. And then and then this 15-hour ferry ride, we got a little bit of sleep. And so when we hit Prince Rupert, the ferry terminal, probably 20, 24 hours later, we were exhausted. We roll out of the ferry with no plan, really. We just had our boats. We walked onto the ferry with our boat full of gear and no car. And so we had our boats on uh, well, wheels. And so we pulled our boats full of gear and everything we needed for this filming expedition off the ferry. And uh, it was the middle of the night. And so we sort of kind of looked around and it wasn't much there. And we so we pulled up the spot to sleep kind of near the ferry terminal. It was relatively quiet, off the beaten path, rolled out our bags and, and sort of uh, started battling the mosquitoes. Yeah. And then, so we hadn't slept for a couple of days at this point. We're battling mosquitoes. It's kind of a, not an ideal sleeping spot. And then we realized that we had, we'd actually put our stuff down on the only kind of dryish, flattish spot. And that spot happened to be adjacent to the railroad tracks. And the railroad tracks pre- <laughs> proceeded to deliver a, a giant train which wasn't there when we laid down, giant train that was there to offload the ferry. And so there was a three or four hour period where the railroad crossing that we were camped near was just ding, 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 ding all night long. And the train would pull forward and stop and back up and stop. And But between that and mosquitoes got almost no sleep. And so we roll out early in the morning. Uh, and the reason we chose that, we didn't want to paddle off into these elusive tidal rapids and these unknown sort of islands, at least unknown dots. Uh, what these conditions were like. We didn't want to paddle and find those at nighttime. So we're just, we're going to sleep, try to sleep a few hours and get up early morning and then go find the spot. And we, we load up our boats and we paddle into this zone uh, where the tidal rapid is supposed to be. And there's a series of kind of small islands in the middle. The whole scene is probably a half mile across, like the whole area of water, the body of water that moves in and out is probably a half mile across. And uh, we get there and there's just huge piles of foam everywhere. Like the kind of sea foam you you see when it gets kicked up by a huge sea storm and lots of wind and it just like froths up the sea and you get these big foam piles. We paddled into like swirling, ominously swirling sea foam piles. So we knew that like this rapid produces some violent water. Like it, it it's enough to turn up the sea. And so we we kind of ease in and and uh, we arrive close to slack. So there's not a lot of current when we get there, and we. Uh, we camp on the island. It's kind of during the ebb. So the water is kind of draining. And we find this really cool spot. We find this great spot for filming. This island uh, in the middle has got a nice high spot. There's lots of rocky, uh, grassy kind of zones. There's this nice fire ring. It is just like just like the whitewater paddlers from the local area there said that we would find. Like really good camping spot right there on the island. There's even like a benchmark, like a geological survey benchmark there. It's like clearly... Clearly, this thing is established. This is what these guys are talking about. We must be in the right spot. We pitch our stuff. The the ebb is is starting to flow, and we we get some some surfing in and some paddling in, just kind of getting to know the space and kind of feeling it out, getting our camera camera angles figured out, and uh, 
gathering some firewood for the night and that sort of thing. And uh, we're finally in a place where we can sort of actually rest. And we hadn't slept for two or three days, uh, two days at that point, that terrible uh, train sort of sleep. Mm. And so we're pretty exhausted. We just sort of just sort of let our guard down. We know we we uh, we had a good evening. Our gear was sort of uh, here and there and everywhere because we had gone paddling. We set up our tents. We just passed out. Everybody was exhausted. And uh, the next thing I sort of remember is here in the rain. And there's like a bunch of a bunch of rain hitting the, the fly of the tent. And uh, you know that thing you do when you sort of stick your hand out of the sleeping bag and you sort of check <laughs> and see if the tent floor is wet. You're like, ah, oh, how how leaky is this tent? And like, what's the, I was you know, and I was sort of right between my two buddies. We the three of us crammed in a tent, and we, uh, and and I put my hands out, and I felt the tent floor was a little bit wet, you know. And I was like, oh gosh, how wet is it? And I start pushing down with my hand, and it just keeps going. Like my hand keeps going down what would be into the ground or something, and I'm just waking up. I'm not sure what's going on. I get to about up to my elbow, and I can feel water all the way up to my elbow. And I can hear the tent uh, next to us with the other set of the film crew and, and Brian. And, and I hear Brian screaming, you guys, guys, get up. We're flooded. We're flooded. And uh, all of a sudden, everybody in my tent's up, everybody up their tent. We all, all, we all realize at the same moment that we are fucked, that we are on this island, and it's currently flooding. And we don't know if it's because of the rain or if it's because of the tides or like what's happening. But cold ass water is is definitely uh, up to my elbow. And we we rip open the tent fly and look out and there's nothing but water everywhere we look. Nothing but water, some distant lights. It's pitch black. And we had camped on the highest spot, but we'd also come during the highest tides. And the months of preparation and planning and pouring over the tide um, we knew that we were there on the biggest run and after all of the sleep deprivation and all of the train uh, situation there when we launched we looked at a tide table that was on the dock there and some somehow in our sleep deprived brains uh, and lack of notes from all of our months of pre-planning we had got something swapped to where the we had thought the high high tide was going to be during the day, and in fact the high because there's two two high tides during the day, the highest one was actually at about 3 a.m. And not only was it the highest one, there was a, a bunch more rain, and uh, tides are just predictions. Um, but apparently, uh, apparently we got it just wrong enough to where where we would camp, we got in swamps, we had lost uh, a bunch of gear. My buddy ran out of the tent looking for his stuff and got instantly hypothermic. Uh, and so there we were in the middle of this island with a tidal rapid all around us. My buddy, hypothermic, uh, we're down two boats and we're all essentially running around naked uh, trying to throw on dry suits and things. The first thing I did was get out of the tent and find my dry suit and put it on. And and we managed to, to fill the two boats we had, the ones that weren't wrapped around trees uh, and, and dangling from the... Because we did you know, tie them to each other. We did tie them to things, but they uh, were dangling from those, those tow ropes, those, those ropes tying them to trees. They were dangling from those and wrapped around another set of trees. Down. The two boats we did have access to, which one of them was mine. I did not lose any of my stuff. Um, was uh, we'd fill it full of stuff and just shuttle it over to an adjacent island, basically. So we had one person kayaking with a boat full of just wet stuff, whatever we could recover, whatever hadn't floated away. And he would dump stuff onto this island and then come back for more. Uh, eventually, we got uh, our buddy onto that island and a fire started and warm fluids in him. Uh, but we essentially huddled uh, amongst the treetops there on this cobbly, uneven, slippery, like Ewok village esque sort of island in the middle of the Busty Tidal Rapids. And again, had a night with no sleep. And we were all sat around just staring at each other, uh, pretty cold and pretty wet. And uh, we're li li licking our wounds. I think we, there was one hammock that somebody could sort of sleep in, and we we essentially, I think I think one of the only things that stayed dry was the weed. Uh, so that that made things tolerable. Uh, so we just we just sat 
sat around and waited for daylight and so we could assess the damage. And uh, in the end of the day, I think we lost a couple dry suits. We recovered all the boats. Uh, I did find my brand new uh, 70 to 200 millimeter camera lens about a foot under seawater. Oh, um, no. And yeah, it was in my dry bag, but I did not close my dry bag before I went to sleep. Um, I just threw it uh, you know, under a tarp. Um, and so we uh, we did we did survive that and we did get through the night and we did shuttle everybody back to town limped home after because we woke up there was an enormous ebb tide then happening uh, the the biggest ebb of the of the whole trip and there opened up this channel wide hydraulic hole that must have been I don't know twenty foot deep foam pile trough all the way across the river and this like it, it i i'm not sure if my memory remembers this or if it actually I, I feel like the island was shaking next to it like this thing was ridiculously like the the, the trees were quivering uh, as was all of us once that subsided we did we did kind of let that rapid die out a little bit we found a way to sneak our way back along the side and get to get out of there and get back to back to prince rupert where we went straight to a laundromat and then to the pub to reassess. <laughs> wow. Uh, so that was our that was our introduction to uh, that place up there. Uh, Alaskans are tough. I mean, the people in the pub we could have told part of our plight to, and, and their reaction to it was very deadpan and very predictable. Like they were like, "Yeah, yep, that sounds like that's what would happen if you went and did that." Well, here's your beer, <laughs> and they got they had no sympathy for us. And uh, we did we did eventually get ourselves cleaned back up and, and got back to business and had had a pretty epic filming session and uh, you should check it out online the National Geographic Fringe Elements episode about uh, uh, a different kind of rapid I think they call it but yeah that that was a worthy trip and uh, uh, I'm glad to have survived it <laughs> it made for a good story in retrospect it's that type two fun you know that fun that's only fun in retrospect. Yeah. <laughs> we've got one of the we get outdoors group uh we did we get outdoors group members at this point in time who's doing a 350 kilometer hike over seven days so he's hiking 50 kilometers what's that 35 40 miles a day something like that every day and uh, i was talking to him today about type two fun as he gave me a call yeah. and like, rob this sucks i'm like yep it sucks now <laughs> It'll be it'll be fine in seven days' time when it's all over. <laughs> that's right. That's right. We remember all the good parts. That's it. Yeah. That's it. yeah. So it is an amazing place, though, and people do people do paddle up there. And you, yeah, you should definitely check it out. But beware, beware the tides, and uh, yeah, camp on the on the taller island during the uh, biggest tides of the year. <laughs> so Paul, I've got, I have to be honest, I've got a list of questions here that I would love to ask you. And I think I'm going to have to arrange a rematch of this podcast to spit out que other questions to you because time is pushing on. But I've got things on my list I want to talk to you about, like how do you find your wife? Um, uh, about how do you go from amateur to pro with sponsors and get magazine articles and expedition invites? Is it really possible to surf a sea kayak? Is freestyle in a sea kayak actually possible? I've got a long list of questions. So I think we'll have to. Oh, those all sound. Uh, those all sound amazing. That'd be super fun. Those all yeah. sound amazing. That'd be super fun. That'd be super fun. I, I do. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would. I would be happy to join you again. Cool. But what I really want to ask you right now is, um, other than the fact that people, if they go sea kayaking, should check the tides and not have a massive high tide in the middle of the night that's going to cover the island you're camping on. Um, other, than that, <laughs> other than that, what's your biggest piece of advice that you'd love to give an outdoor enthusiast? The biggest piece of advice. I think I'm going to bring it full circle here. I think I'm going to bring it back to the community piece. And I, I think for for me, a big part of getting people excited about getting out into the outdoors is the, the idea that it can help make a difference in the world and it can help people fall in love with the wild places that still do exist. And I think one of my biggest pieces of advice is to bring somebody who's not an outdoor person into the outdoors and and don't take them where you would want to go or that where, where it'd be exciting for you. A lot of people... Oh yeah, come, come come whitewater kayaking with us, and we'll flush you down a waterfall. Uh, but to to really take enough time to build community and to bring other people into 
this this world, both for the purposes of building that community to help support you and get more more opportunities for you to get out there and and go on adventures with people, but also as a means to getting people connected in a deep way to these places that we all love and that need protection. And if people if people give a shit about the place because they have personal memories to it, then they're gonna they're gonna take action to protect those places and to and to help keep it possible for for us to access them. And so that's my biggest piece of advice is to bring a friend who's not an outdoor person and create experiences for them that make them uh, uh, realize what they're actually capable of and and they, they kind of give them a hero's journey into the outdoors and get them really personally connected to it. So I think, I think that's one of the ways we, we, we improve the world. Awesome. Awesome. And that's kind of linked through to, to what you're doing today, because today, if I'm not wrong, you don't earn your living in the outdoors anymore. What, what's happened and why that transition away from paddle sports and the outdoors into what you're doing now? Yeah, so I, I, I really think of it as not moving away from the sport so much as moving away from having my living come from that. There's a few reasons for that. I think that the original motivator for me was the idea of having uh, more time with my family, uh, specifically on during kind of during the summer weekends. You know, I had uh, a great career of, of coaching people in the outdoors, but a lot of folks who pursue outdoor uh, endeavors like that, they really have weekends available to them, which which is so important to take advantage of. Is and I I, I really. I'd love that all those people made my career possible. Uh, but I really did want to make sure that when my kids had their kind of summer weekends available when they're in school, that, that I could be a part of that and be taking them out on these adventures and get them connected to the outdoors in that same way, such that they would care about these wild places and, and have those personal memories for themselves, just like I had as a kid. And the, the cruel irony would be such that I, I, I would spend a, quite a lot of time out, uh, taking other people on grand outdoor adventures while my family uh, either would sit at home without me or um, or, or be, I'd be away from them uh, quite a lot with travel. And so uh, for me, I wanted to find something that allowed me the flexibility to get more of my work done during the week. But the, uh, the also the other, the other side of it was uh, I think something in me was ready for uh, a change such that I could prove to myself that I, that I could. Yeah, being a part of that sport and, and the outdoor industry for so long since I was, you know, l literally a kid, uh, and that having been the the real kind of basis for my professional career, I was always kind of uncertain if I could make it doing anything else. You know, do I do I have, uh, you know, enough value outside of my my particular niche sport to to make a a bigger impact for people maybe in their lives or uh, make a bigger impact for me down the road when, when maybe I'm not physically able to do the sport at the same level. Cause I definitely became acutely aware of the narrow window of opportunity uh, that my body would allow me to pursue the sport at, at the level I wanted to. Uh, and I needed to start building something towards being able to have the same sort of feelings of fulfillment and taking other people on a transformational journey and, and having them win. I needed to find that in, in other ways that didn't require me to be uh, 100%. You know, when I when I have a big, I had a big shoulder injury, and it's another big kind of epic, epic surf story that we can go into at some point down the road. But uh, it, that, that made me very, very aware that my my body's not going to hold up to this sort of uh, level of, of activity and abuse forever. And and so for that reason, kind of being ready for the next step, but also being aware that it's a it's a temporary and wonderful opportunity that I've been enjoying. Uh, I needed to, to start building something for that, that future. Um, but it's cool. I mean, having, having high five moments and seeing somebody uh, grow confidence and change as a person because they ran a waterfall is amazing. Um, and seeing somebody change their business and their life and something that, that gives them a, a level of win that impacts everything in their whole entire world is, is in some ways even more amazing. And then I can still go kayaking and, and teach people for fun, which I, is still something I love to do. Mm. So if, if somebody wants to get coached by Paul Kufi today, what's the best way of them going about it? Not your business coaching, but they're a kayaker and they want to go paddling with Paul Kufi. How do they achieve that? 
Yeah, so I, I still get invited to some international symposiums, so Tika uh, symposiums and different workshops and, and, and programs that, that kind of happen. Uh, there's one down at uh, Paddle Golden Gate, is the next one I'll be coaching at. Paddle Golden Gate is a big sea kayaking uh, weekend uh, down right underneath the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And so that's that's the space where I'm going to be doing some some coaching. And my sponsor, uh, P&H Custom Sea Kayaks, is going to be bringing me down there. And uh, and Kogatat's going to be helping things out as well there, my other other sponsor. And they'll, uh, they'll be putting me up and having me coach folks all weekend at that event. So uh, that's one to, to, to check out. And then uh, occasionally I'll still do uh, whitewater safety and rescue sort of courses because I think that's a way that I can help make our sport safer and give people, especially locally, more knowledge and awareness because uh, I'm going to be paddling out there with them. I'm going to be maybe on the other end of that throw bag. Um, I, I'm, I, still, uh, I still think it's important to kind of build up our community's knowledge base and keep people safe and keep people having fun. So so far to rescue courses and things through Alder Creek Kayak and Canoe are things that I'll still be doing. Um, and who knows whatever kind of other opportunities for for travel. Um, I'll go anywhere I can take my whole family and uh, and go kayaking in amazing places and, and teach people. So uh, always looking for more opportunities like that. Awesome. And so I, I've got a few questions to like finish off the end of this interview because both of us have uh, other engagements. Um, what do you predict the future of outdoor recreational sport to be, or maybe kayak? canoe sport to be what's the next big thing the next big thing um so for paddling in general it's hard to say there's so many different uh, types of paddling out there i think that the uh, whitewater scene and what people are doing there is incredible they're throwing big uh, freestyle tricks off of waterfalls and huge wave features and things there it's amazing to see what's next i I, I've been trying to predict what's next in that world forever, and it's hard to say. I think the tricks are going to keep getting bigger and throw the drops, and it's just amazing what's going on right now. And some of the, the big expeditions are, are really cool. I think that, um, you know, frankly, that I think paddle sports is, is an amazing sport, but I think it's like a lot of sports um, is in danger in some way. Uh, it's it's it can be quite involved. Um, there's a certain lo- level of, of risk, and there's a certain level of gear needed. Um, and so I think what's what's going to be really important is to bring people in through those experiences, through those rental opportunities and things like that, where you can actually get people uh, engaged with an opportunity or a space um, on a short term basis. You know, so many people are renting. They're, they're taking Uber instead of owning a the car. They're, they're renting gear instead of owning it. I think it's really going to be important to embrace that. And I think it's an opportunity rather than, than a risk for the industry. There's a lot of gear manufacturers and things that are nervous about it but i think that it it allows the sport to open up to the general public and the masses uh, and i think that that's that's what it's going to be is it's going to be improving access and making it really easy for the general population to engage with these things without having to buy all of the stuff and without uh and, and on the other side of that is is be creating really really good coaching really good uh leaders and paying those people what, what it's worth I think uh, I think if we implemented more of that, we'd see healthcare costs in this country drop dramatically and get more of the general population out, out and enjoying whatever the outdoor pursuit is. But especially kayaking and paddle sports, I mean, it's hard with the lack of time people have these days and the limited resources that are that are there to pursue the sport. I think there's the next big thing for outdoor sports is improving access and embracing the rental sort of uh, mindset. Cool. All right. Are you ready for some quick fire questions? Fire away. Cool. Beer or beer or wine? Oh, tough one. Beer. I like beer. red wine though. We have a lot of good Pinot Noir. Beer. Uh, excellent. Save it for when I come next. Oh, by the way, is my room still my room? It is. There is a bounce house and a ball pit in there though, which you won't mind. No, fun. that's fine. That's fine. For those of you listening who don't know, uh, I've I've actually adopted a room in Paul's house for when I'm in Portland. So I was just making sure it was clean, tidy, and ready for my next visit. Um, it, uh, go on. <laughs> it, 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 it will be. Again, you might have to sleep in the ball pit, but we'll work that out. That's fine. That's fine. That's it's fine. It's inflatable, if, so we can 
if, if we have enough of the beer and wine that you've got, we'll be in the ball pit. Will be a very comfy place to spend a night. Um, you won't care. You won't care at all. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I managed to dodge the, the the story around when we met in the island in the Columbia. So we'll save that for next time. Um, for now. For, for now. now. Yeah. <laughs> What's the last? Book I have you- photo evidence, Rob. You. you- I know you remember the photos. So. Ah, I think if people go on one of our Facebook profiles, they'll probably find that photo, actually. <laughs> they might have to dig. It's out there, though. <laughs> definitely it's, definitely part of, it's been part of the, it's definitely been part of the pub quiz. So ah, that's yeah. a story for another time also. Pub quiz is going on my list for next time as well. Um, what was the last book that you read? <laughs> The last book that I read, I've actually been diving uh, deep into habits. So I have uh, really enjoyed James Clear's work, and Atomic Habits is a book that I've reread recently that I think everybody should check out. Uh, so much of what we do every day is sort of automated and subconscious, and when you can take ownership over that stuff and kind of intentionally place new habits in your world, uh, you can you can do anything you want to do. Um, so that's one that I've, I've really been enjoying recently. Atomic awesome. Habits by James Clear. Atomic Habits yeah. by James Clear. I'll put a link for that in the description of the show. Um, fast or slow? What's your preference? Slow. Slow. You said slow or fast? Fast or slow. slow. Oh. oh, fast. Yeah. I was going to say, the man with a Ducati motorbike really should like fast. It's, uh, yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite outdoor location? I, you know, that's a tough one. So Cascade Head, we talked about, is really amazing. I also love Opal Creek. Opal Creek is in Oregon. That's stunning. Cool. Um, And what's your biggest piece of learning in the outdoors? Biggest piece of learning in the outdoors is learning who I actually am. Because the outdoors brings that out in you. You have the space to actually think about it, and not the clutter of all the daily you know, notifications and thoughts of work and all of that. But it also tests you to your limits uh, quite often. And uh, when you you kind of explore those limits, you get to know who you are. Superb. All right. And now I'd like to hand the mic over to you firmly and give you sixty seconds to say something to the outdoor world that you think can profoundly change the world. Easy, right? So easy, so easy. Uh, yeah, so I, I think that there. Uh, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to the access thing. I think it's I think it's gonna be fighting uh, and for really really quality access to really well protected wild places. And I think the way that we do that is not to wall them off and uh, just sort of hold them in regard and value as just aesthetic things that you don't get to enjoy. But I think it's really important to get people out out in them and exploring them responsibly and doing it with human powered craft. So kayaking and hiking and climbing and all those fishing and all those activities that get people a vested interest in their outdoor world and connected to, uh, to the earth and the place they live. I think that's going to be the biggest, most profound impact on the world at large. Um, and when you, there's, there's value beyond the aesthetic or, uh, the animals that no one else gets to really see or even know what the names of are. Uh, when they have personal experiences in those places, they will, they will, and they have they have emotional experiences attached to them. They will, they will go to the end of the earth to protect them. So I, I, I'm going to go with keep keep fighting for access and keep bringing people out into the in the wild spaces under human power. Fantastic. I agree. I agree. And and the last thing I really want to know is if people want to catch up and follow Paul Cuthie, his adventures, um, past, present and future. And I guess a lot of future is going to be adventures about getting your boys out more. Um, How do they connect with you? Where Where do they go? What do they do to connect with Paul Cuthie? Yeah, so well, my, my coaching business is called Tributary Coaching. So if you go to tributarycoaching.com, tributary, like a, a side stream, coaching.com, uh, that'll be the space where you can find kind of events, workshops coming up, uh, what I do for work now. And uh, there's a blog associated with that. You can also uh, visit a couple of the sponsor websites I do some writing for. So Outdoor Research and Kokatat will have different blogs and different events and things that have come and up and going to. 
Um, so yeah, watch watch that space there, and uh, um, come and see me in Portland, Oregon. Was that an invite? I'll be there. Come on out, come on out. It's been too long. <laughs> it's been a bit a year or so now. Awesome. So Ridiculous. thank you. Uh, it has been ridiculous. Mr. Paul Cuffey, thank you for being a scholar and a gentleman <laughs> and a, a paddling rock star. It's been a pleasure to have you. And let's get another 60 minutes in the schedule in the sometime in the next few months to go and ask you the rest of the questions that I've got on this piece of paper in front of me. Let's do it. Sounds fun. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Stay awesome. Cheers. This episode is brought to you by the We Get Outdoors tribe, where your next adventure is just one click away. You can join this, the fastest growing outdoor group on planet Earth, and become part of a tribe of like-minded outdoor enthusiasts, sharing your adventures, their adventures, trips and insights, and helping to ensure you plan and have the most perfect adventures. Click on the link in the description below to join for free right now.